Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Bitches in Business. This is episode 203. And we are joined by our first non-bitch in business. <laughs> we are joined by a man in business. <laughs> this is Dave Schoenbeck, and he is actually our business coach um, and business coach for a lot of other people. So um, we are super excited to have him with us today. We're going to share all kinds of information about what a business coach does, how we work together, and then everything in between. So Dave, why don't you introduce yourself and give us a little bit um, about your business? Great. Uh, thanks for having me on your show. It's great. This is just like a regular coaching session almost, except <laughs> we're, uh, we're live. So that, that's kind of fun. So my name is Dave Shanebeck, and I'm a business and executive coach, and I coach the CEOs of small to mid-sized businesses and used to be just the US but now I'm kind of international which is which has been a lot of fun so I got in this business because uh, um, I was successful at, at uh, another business and uh, was cashed out of that and I thought I was going to uh, retire and that was a really bad thing for me so uh, I, I uh, started a coaching practice about 10 years ago how long were you retired about nine months. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was just enough to get all a lot of, them, of the things on my bucket list checked off, but uh, not and and it's just enough to also bore me. What was it specifically? Was it just boredom, just not feeling? Like yeah, you know the weird thing is after working for 30, 30 plus years, and I was a retailer, uh, did a lot of, a lot of different things uh, in, in a very aggressive sort of industry to be idle and I kind of lost my purpose, you know, and uh, when I start after a, a time to, you know, think through what I wanted to be when I grew up, um, uh, the, the thing that, that, that I enjoyed the most out of my corporate life was uh, developing the next generation of leaders. Sure. So, uh, so I kind of looked around to see how I could do that and, uh, and fell into this uh, business coaching uh, idea and, it's been a, a blessing for me. I really enjoy it, and I can't see myself ever really retiring from it. Did you just say it's been 10 years? 10 years, yeah. I didn't realize that. Wow, it I didn't long. either. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That was uh, 25, 28 years in the retail business, food and drug stores for lots of years all over the country, different roles, and then uh, I was lucky enough to be one of the co-founders of a little uh, retail startup called Babies R Us. R.I.P. R.I.P. We yeah. had lots of conversations about that. That's sad. But let, yeah, the, uh, let the notes reflect that I left it in very good shape. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> let the record show. Yeah, <laughs> it went right. downhill after you left. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Babies R Us. What are the key takeaways that you have from running? It was a Fortune 500 company, right? It was, yeah. It was what, a $3 billion business. Yeah. What are those key takeaways from owning and then eventually selling a business like that and how can we translate those to small and medium-sized businesses okay. all right the, that's a good question one of the, one of, the, one of my big takeaways from that whole experience was that um, the business can outgrow the talent level uh, uh, qu quickly quicker than you think so when we started the, the company it was just a handful of people and they were loyal and wonderful and i love them and i still love them and uh, but, and they were good for being, being a small business, but when it grew and grew and grew, the, a lot of those people maybe just didn't have the, the bandwidth or skill level to take it to the next level. And uh, so that was really hard to do, but needed to be. There's a big difference from running a $10 million business to a, a $2 billion or $3 billion business, and it takes um, uh, different skills and, and uh, expertise. So that was that was a big takeaway, and, and it was painful and a painful lesson uh, for me. Um, you know, as long as we're doing full disclosure, the other th the other thing that I learned uh, through that process is that that I couldn't save everybody. You know, and, and in my heart, I wanted to. I wanted to make sure that every every one of those people that worked for me and with me were successful. But some people just I couldn't. You know, you, you can't do it. So uh, painful, but true. Did you go through an IPO when you were with them, or no? It was always uh, we were private. about to be uh, uh, spun out. We were within sixty days of being an IPO, and uh, in the eleventh hour of that, 
uh, Toys R Us wanted to go private, so they threw us into the deal. We were sister companies. So we, we brought $3 billion worth of value to the transaction, but it certainly changed everything. And, and uh, if that wouldn't have happened, we would have been, I believe, a very successful, much larger business and uh, still in business. I'll guarantee it. Yeah. Huh. Um, you, you said something there that made me think of, I was just thinking about how, you know, all, all these big like tech companies that kind of started small, these little teams, and they're still being run a lot of times by that same original founder. And it kind of makes me think of what you just said there, that that's not necessarily yeah. always the right, the person who had the vision isn't yeah. necessarily the person that should lead it when they're a $10 billion company. Yeah, look, look at uh, Google, the two founders, yeah. uh, Sergey and... The other one. Yeah, the wow. other guy. Uh, you know, they they were smart enough to say this Larry. is too big, and they and they brought in uh, brought in a uh, an outside uh, CEO. Yeah, um, and, I think that uh, takes you know, takes a lot of like in insight to yourself, and probably a strong arm of a board to yeah. you know yeah. bring those people in. Well, I, I found that with uh, with a lot of my clients. All of my clients are technically sound at what they do, the, the day to day. They operationally, they know their business and they're very good. What they what they don't have is the classic business training, and that's that's part of what I help bring to them, so that I can transfer my years of experience to 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 them, so they they develop those skills and eventually don't need me. <laughs> so one of the things that when we first started working together, and we've said this on blog posts and on these types of chats before with people, is that I think what you brought to us is like that understanding of that we do need to think about our business in a more strategic way that we were like, well, we don't need to do that. We're not this big corporate. It's just mm -hmm. two friends running businesses and doing marketing for clients and occasionally working with other people. We don't need to have this like strategy. And you've definitely instilled in us the fact that, yes, we do. We need to start thinking about our business that like it is a much larger company than it is. Is is that something that you find often? Are we unique um, in that, or no? You're not unique. That's that's pretty. Uh, it's, it happens in almost every case. You know, the the, the interesting thing about co coaching CEOs of small businesses is that that uh, you uh, you guys, while, while you're technically sound, the 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 business skills aren't there, and it's and it's also very lonely when you're running running a private company. You know, where are you getting your advice? Who are you talking to? So the part of the role that I play uh, with you and others, the other 14 companies that I, that I coach, is that strategist, that mentor, the one that asks the questions about, have you thought about this? Here's another option. I've seen this before. We've done this in another company. So it's, uh, it's that outside uh, sort of uh, influence that, that you just don't get when you're by, your, by yourself. What is like a practical application of that besides just asking that question? Like, what does that look like with other clients? We know what it looks like for us, but yeah. somebody comes up to you and what do you do? What are you going to do for me, Dave? My business. Um, okay. So it, it runs the gamut of, uh, um, uh, here's, here's, here's the, the statements that I hear. I, I typically, uh, I'm a bad people, uh, 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 judge, uh, don't judge people very well. So, how do how can I do that differently? How do I how do I do that? I have I have people on my staff that I should get rid of, but but I'm uncomfortable doing that. How do I do that? Um, I need I need a marketing uh, a plan, uh, a business development plan. I really don't know. I've never managed salespeople. What do I, how do I do that? Uh, processes. I, I I have three or four things that break every month, and I don't you know I don't I need some help figuring out how to do that. Um, I don't understand my financials. What what is what does this all mean, and where are we going? Um, I, the metrics of the business. Uh, what what should I be watching for? Um, so th those are the kind of typical qu questions. Oh, the other one of the big ones is I am I, it's so busy that I can't. I, I lost my life. So help <laughs> me get organized. That's probably number one out of all of them. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's something we talk about a lot on here is just balancing of work and life because, you know, yeah. you can just work till midnight, you can work till 3 a.m. There's always something that needs to be done at some point and things that we'll never get to in this regular day. So, right. is there yeah, so ever how do, you, how, do you, how do you prioritize what to work on? I mean, right. that's, that's the hardest thing because everything seems when you're in the in that tornado of, uh, of activity, you, you, everything seems the same. 
everything's urgent. And how do you how do you separate out from that? And one of the first resources that you gave us, and I can't remember what's the like the short ebook that we read um, about where you what, you organize. What's it called? Uh, the, the one minute to do list. Yeah, the one minute to do list where you organize your tasks. And I still sort of operate in that, but I love my biggest takeaway is that is what can I what will end in the world if I leave this till tomorrow? Like, can I walk away yeah. from my desk? And half the time that is a client thing. If a client has something launching tomorrow, yes, we have mm -hmm. to sit at our desks until that gets done and fix yeah. that fire. Otherwise, it's probably not the end of the world. So I sort of have that mentality in those conversations when I really need to get out the door or I have a list of 20 things, like what literally cannot wait till tomorrow. Because sometimes exactly. that exists and a lot of times it, it doesn't. Right. Yeah, the book like is that. a one-minute to-do list written by Michael Lindenberger, and I just uh, just shot a video that that I'm going to put up uh, about that, encouraging people to read it because it's an excellent book. Yeah, you book also America. had us do is it disc profiles? I right. literally talked to someone about that the other day. I was like, I'm a high <laughs> whatever it was, and I thought that was it's so helpful because I think even now for some clients or prospective clients, we're like, oh, they really respond to being the person in the know, or they really respond to like super energetic, aggressive type mm -hmm. personalities. So like coming think, at it from that angle is so helpful. Yeah. What was different about what you did versus what I think probably every coach takes you through some sort of strengths finders, right? Is what we, we did the profiles for each other and for ourselves, but then mm -hmm. also for our clients. So like Nikki exactly. just said, like going, when we have like an issue with a client or like a, you know, a very high funk, like a, a client who's really hard to communicate with kind of all mm -hmm. over the place like we really zero in on how but they're also different so yeah. you have to figure out what their personalities are like to communicate right best. if you know the behavioral style of people that you're selling to and you know what motivates them then your style would just be your pitch is going to be different because you have to tailor it to the to the individual and that's that's the real outcome of, of the assessments the at least the behavioral assessments that i do is that once you learn that, and many of us have it intuitively, but once you learn how to do that and how to recognize those signals, it's it's amazing what how much more influential you can be. Right. Can you talk to us about what are things that every business owner should be doing or they should have? I know in our conversations we're always like, what about business insurance? What about a line of credit? <laughs> like we just come at you with like 40 random questions we thought of during the week. Like what are those things off the top off the top of your head that mm -hmm. business owners should do? Well I think the the best is to have have advisors. That's the first thing that I would recommend that you that every business owner think about is uh, you know, do you have a coach? And I hope you do, whether it's me or not. I hope I hope some you get some advice from someone. But you need an attorney uh, at some point in time, a business attorney, a real practical, um, affordable business attorney. Everybody needs a banking relationship. Every every business owner, um, and and a CPA or accountant. And so those are the four roles that you really should be surrounded uh, uh, or surrounding a CEO. Um, but what you, there's a long list of other things that we, that we, everybody needs, you know, business insurance is obviously one, it's not a must have, but it's a kind of a need to have at some point in time. A yeah. business plan? Business plan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Business plan. You know, everybody says, you know, when there's a, there's a thousand different templates available on the, uh, on the, uh, internet, but you know, what I, what I really like doing and I ask all my clients to go through is, uh, is the. The marketing plan because I think uh, mm -hmm. personally I believe if you build a marketing plan it is the foundation of a business model it rationalizes your your business model and uh, it really if you answer those questions and it makes or uh, writing a uh, full-blown business plan so much easier because you work through the tough questions right I don't think we could agree more with you on that I think we come across clients and even things for ourselves. We're like, you need a marketing plan. Like what's happening in six months? Like, what are right. your goals? Who are the people? And how do you run a business without knowing all of these things? And I think one of the things we started even before we met you, and then just have really continued on since working with you is putting goals together each year and then breaking them down by month of like, here's what we're going to do every month for this business. And I can't tell you how helpful 
I think that is. That that everyone should do. Is to go back and see your successes or then also recognize that, oh, we totally fell short or, oh, mm -hmm. we didn't even, like that was clearly not, clearly not a priority because we discussed it and then never made it a focus for the year. Mm -hmm. And so is it something that's worth, there's always going to be tons of ideas and tons of great ideas. I think we've got yeah. binders full of great ideas, <laughs> but <laughs> binders I'm... full of women. Well, everybody does. <laughs> What's that old saying? If uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take, get you there. Yeah, and right. it's really, really true. And, and I'm a firm believer that 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 there's so much said about strategy, and so little done in execution. You know, what's, what's the song? Uh, you need a little less talk and a lot more action. <laughs> and that, that's really what, what, what it's about. I mean, if my personal belief is that if you do enough small things in, a, in three or four different areas, that the leveraging effect for results, being sales, profitability, growth, whatever that is, is, is 10x what, what you do if you try and, try and do, uh, you know, the, throw the Hail Mary and do the, you know, the amazing... Uh, you know, uh, hit it out of the park sort of sort of strategy. It's it's more about grinding through a lot of the small mm -hmm. things. So yeah, and so that's when I when I started. Yeah, go ahead. no, no, go ahead. You're the, you're talking. When I started started my business, it was it was it was really about maximizing execution for my clients because there's there's so much strategy and and a lot of you can come up with your own strategies, but really, how do you get it on the ground? Yeah, really make it work. And that's the hardest thing I was really going to say. I think especially for us as a marketing agency is that we want it to be perfect, right? It's really hard to put something out there that's only like just started or like, but if we wait for perfection, we're going to be waiting forever because we don't have time for that. <laughs> and so that's just a constant reminder, I think, to be like, is this just good enough? And obviously there, there needs to be, you know, we can't really half-ass something because it, yeah. our marketing ourselves is important for showing so, clients what we're so able true. to do. We try and go for that 100% solution. And really, if you can get 75, 80% solution and right. fix the rest of it on the fly, it's better right. to create action and movement than it is to, mm -hmm. to sit hunkered down wondering whether or not you're ever going to get, uh, you know, it has to be just, just so. No, it right. doesn't. Nobody, nobody yeah. really cares. What's that saying? Like something done good is better than something not done great or whatever yeah. the yeah. like just do it and hopefully right. it's gonna yeah. fall into place yeah i think uh, i think it was general george Patton. remember him from the world war ii uh, movies and i won't get this phrase completely right but his his is uh his message was a good plan violently executed now is much better than a great plan done in a month yeah there you go <laughs> yeah and that sums up my philosophy right it's our marketing, violently executing. <laughs> um, let's talk about things that businesses should be tracking. I know we do financials with you. Mm -hmm. um, what are those things that businesses should track monthly, yearly, weekly? Okay. What I advocate for all my clients is that, that we have some sort of panel of metrics that, that we use to track the results in our business. I like to make people think about it as like the dashboard of your, your, of your car. So how do you know if your business is healthy and moving in the right direction? You know, in the car, obviously you have a tachometer, a speedometer, a gas gauge, and a, a few blinking lights and oil pressure and, and all that. But a business needs the same thing. So what I advocate is going beyond just the traditional what were sales last month but, but some of the components that lead to that. So what was your lead count last, last month? What was your conversion rate on those leads? What was your average sale? Uh, what's your frequency of purchase if it's in a, in a transactional sort of business? So if you can get those kind of measurements, the number of website hits you know, or, or likes or whatever, whatever it might be. Every business has different metrics. But I like to get people to think about 10, 15 max of the metrics that I can easily pull out of my out of my results that are uh, that are uh, predictive, so it will help me understand how to do that. And I, I'm all, I also have a uh, strong aversion to asking people to track things that are meaningless. And, and you know, let's 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 get the eighty percent solution. Then. Let's get the things that can really tell us uh, about how we're doing, and then stick on that and watch that every 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 month. Or week, depending on what your interval is. Cool, that's a good one. Yeah, and you, I think we 
because of the, our size of business, because we're not transactional. I mean, we obviously have transactions mm -hmm. with our clients, but it doesn't take, you know, 20 new clients a month to keep us afloat. It takes mm -hmm. like consistent clients over obviously 20 new clients. We're not going to say no to, but um, okay. we're, I think that was something that was new for us to try to understand is what should we be looking at? Like, do we actually need to look at these financials on a monthly basis? And yeah, I think sometimes it's like, great, we were on budget oh, or yeah. like we were a little bit over, a little bit under. And it's kind of, you know, that's something that was even new for us is trying to like budget when yeah. the B word. I, right, the B -word. I know, exactly. You didn't mention it yet. Um, <laughs> that whole thing and looking at it on a monthly basis. And it's, it's a weird thing because we might budget $5,000 for travel for one year, but we don't know exactly when that's going to come in. So if we, if we planned a thousand dollars this month and it didn't hit, we're not a thousand dollars richer. It's probably going to come in October. And yeah, so it's right. just this weird thing that we have to do where we're, and that's probably normal for any business of our size where it's not necessarily, we've got some software things there every month, but otherwise our budgeting is just, you know, what we think is going to happen this year. And that's a weird, I don't know, I guess that's every business, but it feels different it when is. it's not like a, we don't sell a widget, you know? Right. I worked with a, with a surgeon and uh, coached him for almost two years and, and uh, and this is how it went the first the first time I brought up budgeting. He goes, I I will never have a budget ever never. <laughs> oh okay. I said, well, could you think about it as a projection? Oh yeah, I could do projection. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do projection. So, so like a budget was thing. constraining <laughs> him, but a projection was probably like oh thinking about it. Yeah. 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 Just semantics. It's what yeah. sounds like to someone. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have you know that my budget last year, my my business's performance against budget was within two percent. Wow! Neat, neat, neat. Like I got it, cooking, my dear. You got it. I don't even know how to track that. I just keep copying a spreadsheet every time we make a change so that I can track the changes because we can't right. find any affordable online solution. Um, so performance against easy. budget is really the metric. I mean, it's it, that was your best guess at the beginning of the year or at quarters when you readjust. Mm -hmm. And the 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 fast read through any sort of uh, financial statement is how did we do against our expectation? Mm. And if it's off, what why? What yeah. what what do we need to do differently? Did you know? Did we just have a bad guess or yeah. is something changing? It's 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 kind of it's driving the your vehicle through the rearview mirror a bit, but it's uh, it, it can help. Uh, you know, avoid mistakes. Yeah, that makes sense. So when does it time for your businesses, the businesses you work with, or just in general, for people to hire someone? Hmm. How busy do they have to be? <laughs> yeah, boy, it's, it, this is a tough one. <laughs> Where do you depends find the money? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I, th I think it depends on the trajectory of the business and what, what's happening in the sales, because usually when capacity uh, or when when demand outstrips your capacity to execute, then you have a serious uh, serious problem. And my rule of thumb is fifty percent, sixty percent. If you can fill the new job fifty per sixty percent of the time, that's that's when you need to add in that person. Because here's what happens: as soon as you add that person in, it impacts your profitability because you get another expense. But guess what? Your capacity goes dramatically up. And a month or two later you see the uh, the positive outcome on it. Businesses bounce when they get when they get additional talent in. Um, and I see it all the time in uh, administrative support for busy CEOs when they get to a point where you know, because you you could add in administrative person at a much reduced rate and allows that owner to do that 300, 400, 500 dollar an hour work that he or she needs to do. So it's uh, you know, it's critical. It's, it's a leveraging. You know, it's painful in the beginning, but once you pull the trigger, if it's well thought out, then then uh, uh, good things always happen. I've rarely seen, oh my gosh, that was a bad decision. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend the other day, and she's wanting to hire a service agency, and she's like, "How will I know it's the right person?" Like. How do you know? Can you offer suggestions or? So is this was an internal hire or an outside service? It's an outside service. Yeah. I think uh, it's just like hiring an, an attorney or a CPA. It's it's a chemistry test. That's what so, I said. <laughs> you know, if, do you like the person? Do you trust them? Uh, do they have a good experience? It's it's just like hiring an inter you know an internal person or an external hire for you. It's the same smell test. Am I going to be happy with this individual? Will they represent my brand correctly? 
and uh, uh, do I feel right about it in instinctively? Well, that's usually and, the rule of thumb. And I also think that like you can make a mistake, like, and that's a really hard mistake. But I know we have friends that I've hired and and then had to let people go because they weren't a right fit. And I remember my friend who has a small agency said it was like he was depressed for weeks. I mean, because it's yeah. so personal. But I also yeah. think it, you know you do have to make the right decisions for your business and you're not always going to make the right ones. Even if you, yeah. this person smells and smells right, um, it may not be right. And yeah. I think, I mean, we haven't been there yet. You know, we it's easy to be in the position we are where we can work with contractors because then once a project ends, we can say, okay, we don't need you yeah. anymore. And no one's, no one's good luck in your either. senior year. <laughs> <laughs> They're usually <laughs> aged, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. But, but let's, let's apply the science to hiring employees. Uh, and that's that's why I do assessments in my as part of my practice is that there's more than just behavioral and motivation assessments. So it's critical thinking skills. It's how it's salespeople how well do they sell? Sell how fast do they learn? How's their emotional intelligence? So those those things are all scientific and can be very uh, predictive of what of what uh, their performance is going to be. Have you why used any you like employee like? I don't know what I'm looking for, like the, like uh, surveys or stuff. Where, yeah, evaluations that you'd like that you could recommend. Oh yeah, yeah. I have I have a couple of te templates that uh, that mm -hmm. I like. In fact, I just finished up a blog about that. It'll be on my website soon about how to uh, how to think about performance evaluations. And the, the the what I found is that we try and make it way too complex. Mm -hmm. We we put the, we put together these ornate sort of. Uh, performance reviews that take forever to do. And I think it could be a quick checklist of rate, rate these functions one to seven and, uh, and how do they can just numerically add them up. The, 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 the really important thing for, for performance evaluations is number one, that you do it. Number two, that this, that document can be a pre-hire uh, discussion. Here, here's, here's the 10, 15 cr criteria that I'm going to be grading you with. So uh, you know the employee, the new employee has it has an out, uh, you know a viewpoint about what uh, what what what's going to happen and how will, how will I be judged? That's critical in, in getting somebody on board and and uh, you know working hard for you. Yeah. So there's a lot of tips and traps on, on performance evaluation, but I'm a big believer in it. I, I think once a year is fine with a couple of updates that are quick and, and more goal oriented. Here's how you did. Up, 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 up. You know, you're you're meeting my expectations, but here's the goals we set out in the beginning of the year. And how are we doing against it? You're kind of behind on this one. What are we going to do to catch up? And uh, that's how you drive performance. Otherwise, people just kind of come every every day and think everything's fine. Right. Set expectations. I think that exactly. that terminology can be used across so many things, especially in uh, work evaluation. Mm -hmm. My boyfriend works for a pretty big corporate company, and he it's interesting how they do his evaluations um a couple things that i think were interesting they do include a little bit of personal goals in there i mean some of them are generally like he has networking goals so i guess you can say that's related to the business yeah. but sure. his boss will talk to him about like what are your personal goals like are you achieving them and i think that that's great i mean i think yeah. you know like did you want to read five books last quarter did you get those five books done like just i think that's a cool thing to yeah. um yeah, to, to ask and to care about. I mean, maybe it's just in a guise of like pretending like you think they have work-life balance, but I, I don't know. They seem like a decent enough company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. The one thing I learned working for a couple of big corporations is that really nobody, nobody cares about your own development except you. No matter what they say, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a corporation, you know, that we value our, you're our biggest asset and we're here to develop you and see, no, you're, they're not, <laughs> you know, that's a big <laughs> lie. It's, it's right. really about what you're going to do yeah. to, uh, what are you reading? What how are you pushing yourself? Mm -hmm. or are you, you know, you, are you learning every day? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Definitely. Um, so this is called Bitches in Business, and usually we talk to women, and women yeah. who own companies, um, and just dialogue about how that is to be women in business. This is a little bit different. Um, so we wanted to ask you about being a woman in business. Like, who are those <laughs> entrepreneurial heroes or people that you ha can um, show to other women to, like, look up to and mm -hmm. um, champion? Yeah. Um, 
through my corporate life, I, I worked with uh, with several women, high powered executives that were really very, very talented and and uh, uh, taught me a lot too. And were also a calming effect for for me too, you know, a nurturing effect when I near, when I badly needed uh, you know some some help. But uh, one one was in charge of administration and human resources, and she was wonderful. She ended up being uh, uh, the the uh, the executive vice president of, uh, of administration for Toys R Us. So she was a great, great uh, friend and still is and, and workmate. Another one, another uh, woman was, uh, were, ran all the merchandising for the Babies R Us at one time. So, you know, she was an amazing asset and a key partner for what we were trying to do. So, but I think my two favorite entrepreneurial women are my two daughters. I knew Aww. you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them are, are have been are wildly successful at, mm -hmm. uh, in their respective industries, so it's really cool to see them move ahead. And, uh, yeah. and they're both in pretty like they both have MBAs, right? Or maybe just uh, one one's position. one's M MBA, but and one's uh, one's not, but like they're both corporate, yeah. kind of in the corporate. Yeah, one's role. in a small business, one's in a corporate environment, but they're okay. they're they're done real well. They're both officers, you know, shareholders. Cool. Oh, wow. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, have you learned anything just from kind of being in the back seat of their their journey? Is there anything that's they've come to you about or that stuck out to you? Or that's new that you're like, oh, that didn't happen 30 years ago when I was. Uh, the whole Me Too sexual harassment thing was has been a big big issue with them. In fact, I was mm -hmm. shocked that it was as big as what what mm -hmm. it uh, what it came up to because in the corporations I worked at, it was very tightly controlled and, mm -hmm. and managed years and years ago. So. So it was it was kind of shocking to me. So I asked my daughters over last Christmas, "How big is this? I mean, is this really something that you face?" And, oh, I got a earful uh, on that. It was shocking to me. So that, that really, really uh, made me gave me pause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I had the same conversation yep. with my, both my parents. Yeah, like, me as well. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah, because when I was growing up in corporations, if any of that happened or there was a sniff of it, it was investigated. And if, if a male was involved in that, it was immediately terminated. Mm -hmm. No question. So and apparently that hasn't happened in, in a lot of uh, companies. So, yeah. hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, sad. It is very sad. Yeah. I mean, it's been a obviously a very great time, I think, to... You know, I think it is a great time to be a woman in business and leadership. And I think there's a lot of, and the same thing. I mean, obviously, we, as white women, we are a lot more privileged than our, you know, mm -hmm. our people of color, our friends of color. And I think that we we recognize that a lot too. And we have those conversations, yeah. and that's something where that's a whole nother level when you think about the diversity of things. So, um, yeah, it's a very we're in a very changing time. I think it's it's an, a yeah. good time to be having our business, and it's also unknown, yeah. like you know. I think about that all the time, especially as when it comes to diversity. I feel like even in my personal life, like I need, I need more of that. I need to have a lot more people that aren't just like me, um, socially, no, economically, point. or, or great just. Great point. You know, I think that's very important. But. Yeah, I think I think I, we just get hardened to that the world is like us, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know what, what's been shocking to me early on as a young leader in in a, in a, in a big company was. That I that I found myself not being not respectful of people that weren't like me, mm -hmm. and it took me years to really uh, you know have the uh, discipline to listen more and uh, understand mm -hmm. where they're coming from and that yeah. they added value in a different way. And that's you know maybe partially because I do I've done two thousand uh, assessments on people, so I'm maybe a little more sensitive to it than most. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the great things since we've been working with you, like looking at different business opportunities and seeing a lot of companies and government agencies really champion women in business, veteran owned businesses, yeah. just any kind of diverse business owners are given even just a, a second look or a consideration, which is yeah. like, yes, we are a women owned business. Yeah, you want are. to be certified, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think it's about half of my clients are, are women. Which is Good, 50, really, 51%, 51%, yeah, that's yeah, the average. 40 to 50% normally depends on what, that, yeah. what happens. So, Good. yeah. And we yeah. just had one on last time, last time. Yeah, Pam. Pam, yeah. yeah. Great conversation. 
With Pam, yeah, and that's been a great connection. We've definitely loved working with your other clients. I mean, obviously, we think people who work with you tend to, we've got to have similar personalities and or similar needs in some sort of way, although I think our companies are a little bit different. You know, you work with a surgeon. I'm surprised to hear that one. Maybe I yeah, wouldn't have gotten along with that one so well. Yeah, what's the breakdown, though? the BS <laughs> we're pretty good yeah doctors are you know doctors are trained not to to have all the answers so they're kind of hard to mm. uh, get through but once you do once you do earn their trust then it's actually a fun relationship you're thinking at a whole different level than, than there's got to be that has to be changing though the doctor of the, having their own practice I mean, most of them are bought up by big health systems now yeah. right and they're working within they probably don't necessarily it's not that they don't have a need, but they're not running their businesses like they were. True. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So as far as a business goes, what you do, we know some of the apps because you've gotten us on some of them, but what do you use to run your business? Tell us about the I think the, the big ones for me are, uh, you know, because I live in Arizona and my clients are all over the world. Uh, for me, I use Zoom all the time um, to communicate. So I'm on Zoom seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day. Uh, so that's a go-to. And uh, as you all know, they use a green screen behind that's behind this board <laughs> that projects the images that I want in those conversations. So that's one that I use all the time. I use uh, Wonderlist. Mm -hmm. you, you ever use that? So it's kind yeah, of a, yeah. And uh, I find that to be really useful at keeping disparate sort of um, thoughts. So I have uh, blog topics, things to buy, Things to do at work, personal life, campgrounds I want to go go to, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's whatever, whatever it might be. And for me, that that really uh, uh, helps. Uh, QuickBooks is a is an absolute go to, and you know, they own most of the, you know, the business. What else? Uh, the one that I that I recommend when when I've spoken in front of uh, um, college uh, students, the one that I recommend to them is uh, is to find a a news aggregator yeah. like uh, I think Feedly's one I use Flipboard and uh, I, I ask them to think about don't bring in things that are personal bring it in personal development tips managerial leadership the things that you really need to do to hone your own personal development and then then those these aggregators bring in the articles that you can read and you get an email every day and here's the here's the top 10 or 15 things you should be reading and because I think that's really important that we're always uh, developing yeah. um, ourselves. So to, to me, that's uh, that's uh, one of the biggies. And the, the other thing I use in my business every day is Trello. So how do you use that differently than Wonderlist? Uh, Trello? Yeah. Yeah, well, Trello is all about, for me, is the project uh, management that I use with, with your clients. clients. Okay. Yeah, the so you use it with here's, yeah. here's the goals. Here's the, uh, here's what the steps we need to take. Yeah. Okay. It's an online real-time sort of uh, project manager mm -hmm. yeah those are the biggies for me cool we were, we were on the call the other day with a potential client she's like i just started using trello and we're like we got it girl we're on that <laughs> <laughs> thanks dave no, no, i used to i used to use butcher paper on the wall with with post-it notes on that's it with, where it came from right that's yeah, how they made say, trello. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the and, whole uh, somebody had a better idea i should have copyrighted that idea <laughs> trademarked it yeah i was listening to a um like an entrepreneur it was awesome entrepreneurs like what they use and um actually the number one project management tool that kept coming up with is asana which yeah. i have checked out but i haven't we never started using it and it was yep. pretty great um it probably even, even more if we started needing it for client work i'd maybe say yeah. like let's try that instead of trello but everybody uses a combination like nothing is a catch-all mm -hmm. so we use slack and trello and then yeah. a couple other things to fill in the blanks and of course email yeah. um and that seems to be like trello is not the communication tool that slack is and so it's, it's oh, yeah. Just, Absolutely. yeah most of my clients use slack yeah 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 base cool. camp is one that a lot of my clients use yeah, here managing, yeah. managing projects <laughs> Tell us, I like, really yeah. feel Nikki. Oh, I just <laughs> think I have too many <laughs> like triggers when I hear the word base camp. Yeah. Uh, I like things that are simple to use, mm -hmm. and, and that's why I don't use Asana because Asana is a step above yeah. Trello. Right. It's, too, it's too complex for more. most people to use. And why bother? Yeah, Trello makes yeah. sense as far as the visualization and just sticking things there. Yeah, I've yeah. turned a lot of people right. on it as well. 
Um, so if someone's out there listening and they really want to start their own business, what's your best advice? What would you give them? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I'd break it down to a few different uh, questions to ask yourself. And the first one would be, uh, wh what value does this new business bring to the marketplace? Mm. Um, you know, because we get caught up so much in the energy of, of a cool new idea. But we, if you stand back from that and say, what, what is the real value? And it, is this just another me too? Or is it something that's unique and different? So you ask yourself that one. I think the, the next one is you, you got to ask yourself, do I, have, or do I really have access to the resources that I'm going to need to keep this business afloat for six months to a year? You know, because they're... they're Businesses don't take off like rocket ships the first six months to a year. It's it's grinding and it's hard to pay the bills in, in the, the beginning. Sometimes have some businesses have a longer cycle. So, do you have enough cash? Do you have access to cash? Do you have have the ability to get loans or whatever to be able to do that? that that's number two. Number three is is and one is my go to question is do you really understand the target? Do you understand the prospect? And, and you need to tell me and tell yourself who that who that is. And I and I want a really robust, def, well-defined description of who that might be. We're going to serve everybody. Um, that's that's a that's a ruse. You know, you got you got to be really focused, and very narrow. And is there enough of them in your marketplace to really make this to make this a viable business? And I think the fourth the fourth question is. What is, what is the real future of this business within the industry? Is this something that's going to be, you know, technology is going to uh, to uh, shove it aside? Is is it big enough? Is it is it uh, uh, are people going to use this for a long time? Or are you just going to be a me too? And I think the fifth question then is: Do you, as the budding entrepreneur, do you really have what it takes? Are you willing to have what it takes? To, to last two, three, four years of grinding? Do you have the support of your family? Do you have, do you have the, the tenacity to see it through? Because that's the one ingredient in all, all entrepreneurs is that tenacity and grit that, they're, that you just, they're like, like a whack-a-mole. You hit them over the head and they just pop up in another, another place. And that's what's, that's what's beautiful. It's a belief that, that, that you're going to be successful. I just have to, have to make it. And, uh, and a lot of people aren't wired that way. They might have a cool idea and they might have this romantic version that I'd love to leave my nine to five job and, and uh, be on my own and I want to want to make cupcakes. You know, where's the market? Do you have the money? <laughs> What's your prospect look like? Yeah, this should be like a requirement when you're trying to open a new nail salon in my neighborhood. Like ask those four questions. Like, what are you trying to do? Like, do yeah. we need another one on this block? Cause there's literally in the last two months, I think there's six nail salons. In and what's, what's the, see what's the ability to raise the prices or to make margin? Right. I mean, you're going to, it's you a commodity. Different. Right. Why go here versus, and you see that with yeah. lots of small businesses, a restaurant goes into a place where another restaurant just failed. Why are you going to be better? Unless you are right. like a star chef and that location probably wasn't good. Your food probably isn't any better. It's just a, Exactly. It's an interesting thing. And obviously, point of differentiation. Yeah. those are all the questions that go into the construction of a marketing plan, which mm -hmm. is the foundation of, of a business model or business plan. Yeah. And I think that big one is like, what makes you different or what is your differentiator? And that is a question I think that probably does differentiate the entre true entrepreneur form from the person who just mm -hmm. wants to give it a try. Well, I just yeah. do marketing. Like, why? What's different? Um, and obviously, Nikki and I, like, we've talked with you about our why, and we're still figuring that out. I think we both have, like, passions and both have um, things that we want our business to be that are on the same length and that aren't on the same length. And um, that still it hasn't been necessarily clear to us, though I do think we are different. One of the things that's always been clear in our business is that our business is very relational and personality-driven. We're not just mm -hmm. a random person to put a social media message out there. We're definitely trying to adopt yeah. the personality and the understanding of the audience and of the client. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a differentiator with us versus other companies out there. There are other companies that do what we do as well. Um, but I do like to think that we do it better. Yeah. Or, or yeah, at least sure. attempt. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And I think as you go along, these questions keep getting redefined and mm -hmm. like defined further and further down. Like yeah. you were talking about who is the audience? I think our audience on October 1st, 2013 is 180 degrees different than mm -hmm. our audience, yeah. you know, on May, whatever today is 2018. <laughs> like, yeah. I think you could like, over the years, you keep chipping away at yeah. what you do and who you yeah. do it for. Like, yeah. yeah. And especially in our industry, it just changes. Like what we were doing five years ago, looking back at some of the plans for our clients, like is not a viable strategy anymore. Not, and it was then. And it's just very um, fascinating to think about how much has changed. And honestly, how what we do has gotten a lot more difficult. Um, than it was five years ago. There's so much more competition. I don't mean for agencies. I mean for audience and for attention yeah, for people's absolutely. messaging. Um, a lot noisier out well, there. It's a lot, and a lot more complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love what you said about is it the right thing for you? Like the la your last question is like I think so many people I want to have my own business but when the, the rubber hits the road it is a much different story of some people just aren't cut out for it. Some people need you know, a real yeah. offense to play in and other people can work and get stuff done outside mm -hmm. of that. It's definitely a, it's your show. You are making right. everything happen yeah. and not everyone is able and to. I think, I think that entrepreneur spirit was really what buoys my moods. Uh, and I, where I enjoy talking to five different uh, CEOs every, every day because it's, it's, it's just that, that great attitude that you can get it done. Mm -hmm. Not every day, but most days. Do you think you could make like a character profile of like a successful entrepreneur, like the same ingredients across the board, or is everyone has you know their own? No, I think I think you can. I think you get pretty close. There are a lot of unique characters between my clients and personality, so it's not there's not a common thread about a behavioral style or, or but but what motivates them to be successful there's a, there's a commonality there's a there's a correlation between between or a success cor correlation that should be so should interesting learn. you should write you that need to write this blog yeah. post <laughs> yeah. put that on your that. wonder list yeah i am going to do that that's a good idea <laughs> yeah welcome. it would be really fascinating to read mm -hmm. Find out even just from your own personal experience, thinking about your last yeah. twenty clients. Or yeah. yeah, I have an ebook on my uh, on my website, and you probably haven't seen it for a long time. But it's the ten critical responsibilities of a business owner, and uh, what 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 I've tried to do with that is to make people think about this is what you're signing up for, and this is what you need to learn and be good at in order to, uh, to do that. So I think I could take that ebook and just turn that into a check sheet. And I've got my blog article. Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> kind of. Always be repurposing. That's right, isn't it? <laughs> so what's next for your business? Are you just keeping on, keeping on, growing yeah. clients? Like when do you max out? When do you feel like it's not fun anymore? How do you vision well, your... I found, found uh, the not fun part. I really enjoy this. In fact, in a per, you know, weird sort of way, I think I was born to do this. Mm. I, enjoy, I enjoy it so. And you and get to expensive for me. trips all over the country. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate where, I, where I'm financially independent. So I do this because I really love it. Mm -hmm. I work three days a week. I work with the people that, that I want, want to work with. Um, my full-time slots are 15, 15 companies that I, that I can work with uh, during a week. And that's pretty much all I want to do. And So you have um, one opening? Did I hear that? <laughs> I, I, it depends on the on the week or the month, but things come and go. I, that I probably means call him now. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's taking the tenth caller. Auction <laughs> <laughs> close in three you hours. Get in. Do you have a particular type of client you feel like you haven't yet worked with, or you haven't? You could. Yeah, you want to work with more. A few, a few industries that I'd really like to do more of, just because I'm intellectually curious. Uh, manufacturing is one that really I really haven't done a lot of, and I, th I just think it would be something interesting uh, to learn. But the businesses I like is, are are the ones where we're not we haven't become a commodity because the commodity businesses are really hard. That's really and, hard. And, yeah. You know, if if you're competing only on price, then you know there's not a whole lot I'm going to be able to help you with probably. And uh, I, you know, 
I'll, I'm certainly willing to do it, but that's not that's not my my target. I like service businesses. I like I really like uh, when, uh, where it's high relationship. But yeah. it doesn't matter if it's uh, B two B or B two C. That doesn't bother me at all. In fact, when I started, I thought I'd coach nothing but retail companies because I was a retailer. That's your experience, that. right? And I coach actually fewer retailers than anything. <laughs> that's weird. That's cool. Um, so tell us where people can find you online. How can I get in contact with you? Um, DaveShaneBeck.com. And if you can see my little board here, <laughs> DaveShaneBeck.com. There's my email. There's my phone. And I'm in beautiful, carefree Arizona. Aww. This is the first time I realized you say your last name is Shane Beck. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, awesome. it's, a, it's, a, it's Dave. <laughs> yeah. Show Beck. Dave. Dave. Every, Dave yeah, Beck. Everybody mess, messes that up. I don't, I don't take Dave that personal Beck. anymore. Huh. Shane Beck. All right. Well, I've never said it right. I will try to start, but probably at this point. It's, it's it took this episode to figure <laughs> out our coach's last name after <laughs> two, three years. Oops. <laughs> um, okay. So I think that's it. Unless you have any final thoughts or no, moments the, of wisdom for us. Thanks for the opportunity. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, this oh, was great. Thanks for being thanks, on the journey with her. us. Yeah. yeah. I, I enjoy working with you ladies. It's fun. Oh, working with you. Nice to have you on our team. All right. All right. Well, everyone get in contact and we will see you next time on Bitches in Business. Thanks so much, Dave. Thank you.